And good evening. Good afternoon and good evening. I am Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy. Today, we're going to be very privileged to have Dr. Farid Garagoslu from Celebration Hospital in Orlando, Florida, joining us. He has tremendous experience with TOS patients. He's developed pioneering approaches to the surgery in these patients. And we've had several very prolonged discussions and adventures learning about the underlying models of TOS. He's progressive, he's anti-dogmatic, he's brilliant, and I think you'll really enjoy his talk. Now, the first part of this talk is on me. We're gonna talk about the history of TOS. And while it's a really long and rich history, a lot of famous medical people in it, I can't tell that whole story in a short period of time. Even when I start telling this story, I get dragged into many side little holes, rabbit holes, because there's so many fascinations in it. But I'm gonna focus on just a few things here. Let me switch now to sharing my screen with a little PowerPoint presentation, actually keynote to give Mac their credit. Fareed, how are you? Hi, how are you, Scott? Good. Your volume is a little bit low. If you can bring up your audio. I just introduced you to our audience as an anti-dogmatic person who's brilliant and willing to question everything. And through your long experience, you've developed some really pioneering efforts. And I have also explained that the history of TOS is very thick and dense. So I'm going to focus on a few things here. I'm going to take a short period of time to go over history. And then we're going to let Dr. Garagoslu go on and describe some of what he does and why he thinks the way he does about TOS and helps move everything forward. So allow me to set up my presentation here. There we go. The history of thoracic outlet syndrome. We're really going to talk about just a few points here. The earliest reports of TOS, the cervical rib, which played in the past a key role in TOS, the historical surgery of TOS landmarks, what I call paradigm shifts. And finally, the unification of TOS, which plays a bigger role than a lot of people think about. Let's talk about the earliest reports of TOS. More than 200 years ago, Sir Astley Cooper was the first person to describe a case of TOS. It was an arterial TOS case in a young woman. And he described his uh, description of a physical examination. In short, she was a young woman. Her hand changed colors. It was always cold. It was painful and numb at the same time. And he discovered little gangrenous spots upon it probably little blood clots from arterial damage. Remember, that's over 200 years ago. In 1875 and 1884, still quite a long time ago, we had two independent descriptions of venous TOS with blood clots in the veins, Leopold von Schroeder and Sir James Paget, both of whom widely respected and very famous in the medical field. They described it independently of one another and published it at different times. And the earliest case report of neurogenic TOS I can find actually goes back to 1831, about 190 years ago. This is probably the first reported case of neurogenic TOS and the first reported case of a subclavian artery aneurysm. Hang on. My slides are not progressing. Here we go. What Mayo described, he says, the thrilling sensations are felt only when the arm is moved or when in examining the tumor, meaning a hard mass, the axillary nerves are compressed. So he could actually create the patient's symptoms by pressing on the neck and compressing the axillary nerves. Now we'll move on to the cervical rib. In 1895, Rentgen, who's very famous in my field of radiology, produced the first medical x-ray. It was actually an x-ray of his wife's hand with her wedding band on it. But quickly, they found that you could find cervical ribs in living people. So because they could find a cervical rib, patients who had these symptoms were sent for these skiograms or radiographs or radiograms. They've been called different things. And they could find a cervical rib, which made it easy for the doctors of the time. They had used this amazing new technology, the X-ray, and they had created the cervical rib syndrome. Now, unfortunately, after that, 
what happened is people found the patients with the same symptoms, but without a cervical rib. And I don't want to go down that side hole too much, but it turns out the cervical rib, while an easy thing to remember, is not the primary cause of many cases of TOS. But to this day, 200 years later, a lot of doctors, if you say cervical rib, they'll say TOS. And if you say TOS, they'll say cervical rib. But we know a little more than that. Uh, 1904, a good landmark, Thorburn, was the first person to remove a cervical rib. All right, that's it, that surgery landmarks, all right? 1861, Coote was the first person to perform TOS surgery, and he did not like being in that area. As hey, I mentioned, Thorburn was the first hey, person to actually remove a cervical rib. Hey, Dr. Worden. Yes. Um, we actually can't see your slideshow, um, so I'm just cutting in to see if you can rectify that from your end. Okay, okay. I'll check right here. Bear with me for a second. Doesn't matter because I didn't put any cute pictures in there. I just put names and dates. Let's see if this will work. Thank you, Herb. How about now? You are good to go. Excellent. We talked about Coot being the first person to go into the thoracic outlet and Thorburn being the first surgeon to actually remove a cervical rib. In 1905, just a year later, Dr. Murphy removed a cervical rib for a subclavian artery aneurysm. In 1910, a different Murphy was the first person to remove a normal first rib. It was a patient who did not have a cervical rib. And this is actually an important landmark. Adson is famous for the Adson sign but he took a very radical approach to the cervical rib syndrome. He did not remove the cervical rib, which was somewhat tough. And instead he removed the anterior scaling muscle and he had good results at first. So now let's talk about some of these paradigm shifts. These are people who thought differently and found things that other people had not described to that time. In 1912, a Dr. Todd described the position of the shoulder girdle ranging from kids all the way up to old people and found that gradually over life, the shoulder girdle changes position relative to the rib cage. And he thought that there was a sweet spot in there at a certain age, young people would develop just the right level of the shoulder relative to the rib and would cause the compression we know as TOS. In 1919, remember this is hundred years ago, Stopford and Telfer who were very famous and widely respected they actually proposed a mechanism where the normal first rib could create a cervical rib syndrome. So it didn't need a cervical rib. They thought a normal first rib could cause the same clinical findings. And that was radical at the time. In 1920, a guy named Law was the first person to do dissections of cadavers. And he found a whole bunch of different soft tissue bands that could cause the same condition. And as I mentioned, Adson performed the first scalenotomy, removal of the anterior scalene muscle in patients with a cervical rib. His reasoning was there's a narrow space. Everybody is going way back to get that cervical rib, but I can just take the front part of the space and it worked. 1927, there are a couple of different papers by these doctors and they were the first people to describe a stroke in a patient with EOS. And they reasoned and later proved that a blood clot would develop in the artery. And then the blood clot would start lengthening both forward and backwards. And when it got far enough backwards, it would reach the arteries to the brain and then cause a stroke. In 1929, Nafziger and Grant in San Francisco, they actually suggested that a lot of scalene muscle anomalies, meaning abnormalities people are born with, could cause TOS again without a cervical rib. Remember at the time, cervical rib syndrome was it, but here are people describing soft tissue abnormalities that cause the same syndrome. And later in 1935, Michael DeBakey and some co-authors actually came up with a name our viewers may have heard of, Galenus Anticus Syndrome. They did give credit to Nafziger who had described it first, but not published. Michael DeBakey, just as a side note, was actually uh, an incredibly famous guy who did a million things, but I believe he was 
the man who created the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, a mass unit. Let's move forward. 1939, Eden first demonstrated that the clavicle could cause TOS. It had not been thought of before this, so he created a new paradigm, but a different paradigm than all the previous disease models. And this is a quote. It's not really important, but at the end, you'll notice that he says, bony obstruction, this is usually provided by a cervical rib, but an abnormal first rib may do so also. So again, he's breaking with the model of the cervical rib. Uh, in 1943, in World War II, these two authors, Falconer and Waddell, found that young men, military recruits, would get some of these same symptoms. And they believed it was due to the soldier's backpack pushing the clavicles, the collarbones, down on top of the rib. And they created a costoclavicular syndrome. Again, another different type of mechanism. And I.S. Irving S. Wright actually was very famous, did a lot of amazing things in medicine. And he could duplicate their symptoms, but he didn't do it by pushing the shoulders down on these young men. He actually did it by raising the arms over the head. He could not reproduce what Falconer had done, so he came up with a new model. And he basically concluded something very important, that when you do a clinical exam, the pulse disappearing, like in Adson's sign, does not correlate with compression of the brachial plexus. This is a complex disease, and all of these people are finding different points of compression and different mechanisms of compression. Right, I'll go further a little bit. Hyperabduction, which means raising the arms over the head. He could uh, diminish the pulse, but he could rarely cause neurogenic symptoms. And in the end, he said, very importantly, he believed there were two different mechanisms. One mechanism that causes tension on the nerves quickly symptoms right away, but the other one causing delayed ischemia where he believed the blood flow was altered and that created symptoms in a separate mechanism. Again, no one had thought of that before. These are all important people, all with different ideas. Here's a long quote. You probably don't want to read the whole thing, but these guys were also widely respected. The important thing here is they said in the middle of the paragraph, there is no general agreement on either the site or the mechanics of the compression. There is no doubt that earlier writings have oversimplified the position, and only in recent years does it seem to have been realized that there is no one cause of pressure common to all cases. Very important. Some other people who realized that it was way complex. A couple of little brief notes. Lord actually performed a uh, resection of the clavicle, collarbone. He also was the first one to remove the pectoralis minor muscle. Many of you may have heard of the pectoralis minor syndrome. We're not going to get into that in detail. In 1966, Roos in Denver did the first transaxillary approach. And in his surgical patients and in cadavers, he found a whole bunch of different anatomic anomalies, things you're born with, like fibrous bands or unusual muscles and he categorized these, again, something new, rather than just a cervical rib or compression of the clavicle against the rib. This one is a not very widely known paper, but in 1968, these two authors showed that patients without a blood clot in their vein, but with elevated blood pressure from raising their arms, that means elevated pressure because the veins are compressed, they could duplicate this Paget-Schroeder syndrome, venous TOS, but without a blood clot. Very interesting paper. Um, Sanders, Dick Sanders in Colorado in 86 introduced a supraclavicular scalenectomy, and that's fancy words, but it's a surgical approach and he's done thousands of these. 1988 was kind of an important year because a neurologist at Cleveland Clinic, Wilborn, Asa Wilborn, he, uh, without going into detail, he just developed a category of disputed neurogenic TOS. And he said, most cases of TOS are disputed because the nerve tests, the EMG, are negative. He never studied, actually, how we know that the EMG may or may not find that syndrome, which is important. And Adesoy, I'll mention, he's done thousands of these procedures, but he, he advanced the surgical approaches. So the unification of TOS is where we lead to problems. This is actually 1956. Pete, who's famous among people who know TOS, 
was actually a trainee in physical therapy, not a physician. And he decided that he should create a single term for all of these previous mechanisms and all of these syndromes. I know it's been a kind of a boring talk to hear how everybody has had these different thoughts, but they were all well-written papers. And this young man, Pete, comes along. He said, yeah, okay, there's multiple syndromes and they all have similar symptoms. But here's what he said from the review of the literature. It's apparent that blah, 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 all these syndromes have a similar symptom pattern, namely that of compression or stretching of the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery, and the vein. So he recognized that there were many different approaches and etiologies and underlying causes in the literature. He said the etiologic, meaning the causes of this complex of neurovascular symptoms remains confusing because there are so many anatomic deviations, okay? So what's his conclusion from that? Conclusion is, they therefore might be grouped together and referred to as the thoracic outlet syndrome. This quote is amazing. He's just described all the previous researchers and all the complexity and how there's so many causes. And then he says, therefore, they might be grouped together. So that doesn't make sense to me, but it's what we call the disease now. And so he came up with the first use of the thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, in my opinion, um, unification replaces a whole lot of prior research and paradigms. This is my quote. It's creating an oversimplified model of a very complex disease. And it's a really unhealthy, pardon my pun, paradigm. It does not help patients with TOS. Even Asa Wilborn, the guy who said neurogenic TOS should be disputed, you don't have to read this whole quote, but he said, Rarely are all the components of the neurovascular bundle involved in any patient, and hence the vascular and neurologic features are more likely to occur independently and in different patients. Even he acknowledged that there were many different types, symptoms, causes. So my summary is really pretty simple. TOS was first described 200 years ago. Many famous people in medicine have written a lot of papers and have found a lot of different things that happen, both anatomically and symptomatically. It's a complex and variable disease. And unfortunately, in 1956, while we made it easy for docs to know one name with three letters, TOS, that unification may really represent a barrier to understanding and treatment of the disease. And this leads me to Dr. Gargoslo, because there are TOS specialists out there right now, like Dr. G, who have been and are continuing to work on these new paradigms so we improve our understanding and treatment. And with that, I want to welcome Dr. Gargoslo. Hopefully I've done this correctly and switched to the right frame. Herb, you'll back me up. All right, good. Can you see me? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Scott. Thank right. you very much. Can you bring um, up your volume anymore? I'm having a little trouble hearing you myself. For you. Are you? I mean, I'm, I, I'm actually joining you, but my iPhone, so maybe, uh, is this better now? A little um, bit better. Yep. Yeah, I'll come right. a little closer to, to this. My apologies, but we'll do our best with the technology we have. So um, um, first message I would say for whoever is on this um, uh, call, uh, webinar, or watching us is uh, if you're confused about the history of this disease, you're not alone. Uh, and the issue really is that never in the history of medicine have physicians, and I say this from personal experience, ever spoken more about a subject that we know so little about. And, uh, and I think that the beginning point for my discussion needs to really be a personal uh, discussion about how um, back in 1992, when I finished my training and started an interest in this area, how my journey has taken me now in the past 28 years to where we are now, because I think that it is a journey that uh, is really relevant to the experience of many physicians. I uh, received a... Uh, a traveling scholarship at the end of my training in cardiothoracic surgery. And as uh, part of that great honor, I had the opportunity of visiting a giant in the field of thoracic outlets uh, syndrome surgery by now Dr. Hal Urchel in Texas. 
And, uh, and even Dr. Urchel, uh, who was way in, in the sort of the mature portion of his career, uh, was confused about this disease. And that sort of kindled an interest in me uh, to spend the rest of my career in trying to understand this. Thoracic outlet syndrome, for those who sort of just sort of look at it superficially, is, um, is fascinating because if you really look at this, we're talking about, we talk about the PEAT classification so beautifully described by Dr. Verdan. And uh, yet, I would say most people would agree that about 1% of the patients have what Pete would say is arterial TOS. Maybe about 2 to 3% of the patients would have what's called venous TOS. And uh, the rest of the patients have this neurogenic TOS. This neurogenic disease is the thing we need to concentrate on. That is 96, 7% of all the patients. And some uh, estimate that about 8% of the population may indeed have TOS. But because TOS is a chameleon, this, this is a disease. I mean, it is, there are a lot of great, smart people who have studied this for the last 200 years. But if after 200 years of studying this, we are as confused as we were in the beginning, it should tell you that this is a complicated problem. And it is not a problem that presents in a simple way. And the fact that we don't have the elegance of simplicity means that we have really been sort of scratching the surface of a disease and we haven't understood it. So maybe we can talk a little bit about our journey and how we think actually we're getting close to understanding it. Now, as a surgeon, I tell you this is true about every single surgeon who sees a patient with TOS. The first thing that comes to your mind is, how do I get out of operating on this patient? How do I get out of this room? <laughs> and that is the honest to God truth about every surgeon who has ever dealt with a patient who comes to them saying, I think I got TOS. And the reason is physicians in general are good, honest people who, uh, who believe in trying to help somebody and not hurt someone. And when they face this confusion that is TOS, the result is they try to run away. And it always ends up with, I think I should send you to physical therapy or to another physician or to another thing. And, and the patients, of course, get confused. And I see this, I am very lucky that I see TOS patients probably like around 10, 15 patients a week, frankly. And every single patient has had the experience of thinking that their physician was trying to run away. And that's true because the physician doesn't understand what in the world is going on most of the time. And he also understands that the procedures that are done, the diagnostic tools that are used are not specific. So let me tell you, this is where I was in 1992, probably more trained in this disease than most people having worked with Dr. Urchel for a long time. And I was confused. And honestly, it is very difficult because a surgeon or it needs a diagnostic tool to know, is this TOS or isn't it? That's a simple question. And we don't have anything, not until recently, and I'll talk about that at the end. Then what would happen to me is I would try to really uh, push the patients away. One day, about maybe five or six years into my practice, and, and honestly, the patients who had surgery by me, either done by what was called this, the transaxillary approach or the supraclavicular approach, they didn't do well. Let's be honest. If a patient does well, they do well. You can't talk a patient into the fact that you had good results, <laughs> which is the majority of times. You know, we would go, we would remove a rib, we would do a scalenectomy, we do all the things that most of the people on this, uh, uh, on this uh, uh, broadcast know. But then the patient is not right. Maybe a little improved, maybe a little bit different, but not perfect. And if they're not perfect, you did the wrong thing. You either diagnosed it wrong or you did the wrong surgery. And to be frank, this is the story of this disease. So... You have to look for perfection. 
if a patient has surgery and they say, you know what, my arm feels like I got a new arm, that's when you have succeeded. And very rarely did that happen to me and I think to most people in that phase of my career. One day I was talking to a young woman and she says, you know, uh, Doc, I'm having trouble explaining to you how my arms feel. And the only way I can tell you is it feels like my leg when it falls asleep. When she said this, it was this like in a cartoon, this light that goes on in your head because she put us into a whole different venue, a whole different world of looking at this disease. I say this to you because it's very similar to most people know the, the, the issues we had five, 600 years ago about whether the earth was round or flat. Now, people weren't stupid. The ones who said the earth was flat were not all of it, you know, stupid and we didn't all of a sudden get smart. What happened is we got a new view on the earth. When they came up with the astrolabe and I don't know what else, you know, and they could navigate past the shores a little bit further, they found that if you kept going, because you were sort of going further with new technology, you weren't falling off the end. So, wow, it's not flat, it's round. The issue is we have had problems in TOS thinking based on our technology, based on our ability to see this disease. And of course, things like Pete, as Dr. Verdan said, have really been done great disservice to this because they've tried to simplify a very complex problem. When this woman told me about her leg, it became very clear that the symptoms, let me go through, everybody in this world knows what a leg feels like when it falls asleep. The reason the leg falls asleep is it has one artery that goes to it and one vein that drains it past the area of your knee. When you put your leg over the other one, the vein gets compressed. When the vein gets compressed, the difference in the blood pressure for the nerves of the vein make those nerves feel different things. It, they go from tingling to, to pain to, to, and to a point where you almost feel like your leg doesn't even belong to you anymore. You have to lift it off and put it down. The longer you hold it there, the worse the nerves get. Now, is there something wrong with the nerves? No, it's a blood flow issue. So to call this symptoms of the, of the cross in your leg neurogenic is inappropriate. This is nerve related, but neurogenic means it's actually caused by the nerve. The nerve is the end result rather than the beginning. This is a blood flow issue. That was exciting because that kind of made it clear that why is it that when we do examining of the nerves, we, we have always thought that there's a nerve being compressed, but nobody, nobody says, guys, the nerves are nowhere close to the first rib. What are we doing taking out the first rib? The brachial plexus where the nerves are don't even come close to the first rib. But yet when we do remove the first rib, the patients seem to get better. For some or somewhat better. So the issue is these confusing things have made us almost forget our basic anatomy almost. But the issue really is that that told us for the first time that maybe the majority of TOS patients who have nerve problems or nerve symptoms don't have it from compression because everybody who's looking for compression, 98% of the time they're coming up short. They can't find it. And then they will use surgery as a diagnostic tool. Oh, I don't know if you have it. Let me take out all these things in your shoulder. And then I'm going to tell you if you have it or not. <laughs> Ridiculous. Now, step one was this concept of crossing legs and, you know, the, the nerve issues from blood flow. Next came a series of patients. And, you know, we have lived through this. Patients who came to me who said uh, they've had first rib resections for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome by very prominent surgeons. And they got a little better, but not perfect. 
And, and to be honest with you, we spend a lot of time in medicine talking in, people into the fact that they're perfect. And they keep saying, no, doc, I'm not perfect, <laughs> you know? But we then, but then you look at their chest X-ray, you look at their CT scan, it looks like the first rib is removed. So you say, listen, this must be in your head. This is not the surgeon, this is you. A new tool came around the horizon at this time. It was the surgical robot. And the robot is just a computerized endoscopic surgery tool, but it has a camera that is high definition and high magnification. So we could see all of a sudden things that we could never see by opening the chest or putting a camera, the regular two-dimensional laparoscopic camera. This was almost like the same navigational tools that the guys got so that they could take their ships further from the shore. We put in a patient, uh, our index patient, a, a, the robot camera in, and we believed him that they did remove the first rib, but there, we said, you know what, we're going to look in here and see what's going on. When we looked in there, to my great surprise, the one little piece of bone, which measured about two centimeters, that connected at the joint between the first rib and the sternum and the clavicle, there's kind of a triangular area, that joint was there. That piece of bone was there. And, and you would never believe that a two centimeter piece of bone would be which is really so far away from the nerves would have any effect on these patients. But since it was there, we removed it. And the reason I removed it is I did remember, this is back in 2006, I remembered Dr. Urchel, a giant in this field, saying that he, did, he knew one thing. After 40 years of doing this, he knew one thing. If you did not remove the, what he called the costochondral ligament or costoclavicular ligament, the patients did not do well. If you could get rid of the costoclavicular ligament, the patients did well. And he didn't know why that was. But getting that costoclavicular ligament it was a very difficult thing. And in his experience, many surgeons did not do that. Well, it turned out the costoclavicular ligament is in the same thing as that little two centimeter piece of bone that was left behind in that index patient. And so when we removed that piece of bone, we all of a sudden saw that the subclavian vein opened up in front of our eyes with this high definition magnification camera. And just a as it was crossing over the to, into the chest. After that patient, we did 11 other patients who had had first rib resection and had no evidence of any anything else except they didn't get better. And every single one of them had this area that was left behind. Because frankly, doing it by going from, you can't get that piece from outside. It's behind the breastbone. So you end up cutting the bone and saying, hey, I got the rib, that we're good. Now, that was the second piece of, this is like, I want you people listening to us to think of this as a, as a, uh, a detective trying to make sense out of a crime scene and how the different things have come in to form that crime scene. So we have the evidence of the woman talking about the leg crossing. Now we have the evidence of this this little piece of bone that is uh, that it was same thing that was observed by Dr. Urchel, but called something else. And now we then get to a point where we said, you know what? We need to look at this rib. We need to look, why is it? What is it about this rib that's different? Now, all these years we have said something is compressing something else. That has been the common denominator in this disease. But no one has said, what is it about this first rib that, that is so important? And what we have discovered as, as, as a result of all this is we did a study looking at the ribs of people who had COS 
And then we looked at normal ribs, and this is all published uh, data, where we found that in a normal rib, there is a little space, and the ner vein that is sitting, that draining the arm and the neck and the shoulder and this whole area, goes over the rib in a little space. And that space protects the rib from getting pinched between the clavicle and the vein from being pinched between the clavicle and the first rib. Well, it turns out that if you, if you look at their bone from patients who have TOS proven by the fact that it was removed and they got all better, they don't have that space. They have a tubercle, meaning like a little bump of bone, which really corresponds to the joint between the first rib and the, uh, the, the uh, sternum. What happened is that this let the light go on in our head to let us think that perhaps what we have called neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome is really nerve symptoms related to compression of the vein. And what we have called venous thoracic outlet syndrome is really the same patient with neurogenic who then all of a sudden held their arm in a position that compressed the vein so long that the vein clotted. So neurogenic and venous thoracic outlet syndrome are really the same disease at a different point in the spectrum. And arterial thoracic outlet syndrome is a whole different disease that has nothing to do with this area. That is a paradigm shift, as Dr. Jordan would say, that is, that was the working hypothesis. Now the paper that we wrote showed the pathology. So we called, we basically said, this is the pathology for the majority of people with neurogenic TOS. And, and the key is the way you define neurogenic TOS is after you've exhausted everything else that, you know, we're, there are people who have nerve compression for something else. You got to rule all of that out. And once that's all ruled out, now you're left with a person who has these weird symptoms, neck, shoulder, back, side of the chest, some headaches and so forth. And, and then you, and then the next question was, how do we prove this? How do we diagnose this? And that's when my colleagues in radiology come in, people like Dr. Verdan with the great expertise in MR, looking at this anatomy, which is very complicated. So to make a long story short, what we believe at the present time, and the reason I get excited about this is we do this surgery many times a week. And the, for the first time in a 28 year career, in the last maybe three, four years, I'm able to do the operation. And when I walk into the room of the patient, the day after surgery, they're perfect every time. This is the elegance of simplicity. So to make a long story short, in our view, thoracic outlet syndrome needs to be separated from cervical rib disease. Things that are going on in the neck, people who have cervical ribs, people who have bands, people have that, that's a different disease. And though that disease really does cause compression of parts of the brachial plexus, the, the, the artery, et cetera, et cetera. That frankly is a very small group of patients. So in a hundred patients, that's gonna be like four or five percent of the hundred. The other patients, the complicated patients are actually the patients who have vein compression that causes the same symptoms as your leg falling asleep, but now it's the arm falling asleep. And and frankly, the other interesting study that we have done is we have gone back and looked at the patients who had what's called Paget-Schroeder syndrome, which is where the vein clots, and we have in the old days called them venous TOS. And we have asked them retrospectively to tell us about symptoms that they had in terms of pain and tingling and all the things that we associate with neurogenic. And every single one of them will recount those symptoms that they dismissed. And then they, they didn't know it was neurogenic. It, they just thought it was something, you know, happening with their arm. But then they went and they did something like 
repeated throwing a ball, working under a car, do all the things that you think of for, for these patients who get blood clots in their vein, and then they clot it off the vein. The fascinating thing is that we've also found that this is bilateral disease because when you do the MR study, looking at, you'll see the same pathology on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then the patient actually, once you fix one arm, will say, my other arm is not normal because now I know what a normal is. Long story, it's a privilege to talk to everyone, but I can tell you the message is clear. If anyone is suspected of having TOS, they need an MR study done by the protocols that people like Dr. Werdan have beautifully uh, um, uh, shown. Those protocols of the MR will take show if there is cervical rib disease or any kind of things in the neck versus something in the thoracic outlet. If it's a thoracic outlet, if there is compression of the vein, you can remove the part of the bone that's compressing the vein and the neurogenic symptoms will go away. And I think for the first time, we are in a position to clarify the waters and, and truly understand that this, th that this technology has allowed us to say, you know what, the earth is round because now we are able to really see things that we never saw before. And, uh, and it's really exciting because this is such a repeated process with the patients. Patients are so tired of speaking to people because the symptoms don't make sense at, unless it is a blood flow issue. And what happens is the doctors, when they don't understand the symptom, they're going to say, this is your problem. This is, you have psychiatric issues, you are seeking drugs, you're just, you know, not making sense. And that really is the failure of medicine and failure of our profession in not allowing, listening to our patients and, uh, and really going with knowledge that is old. Thank you for the privilege. So Fareed, that's, that's awesome. It's a great explanation of the spectrum. Um, I first want to mention that we don't have any questions coming through on YouTube. We think there's a technical issue, but I'd like to ask you a few if I could. Um, sure. Does, does anybody know what converts a patient with these symptoms, but no blood clot, to a patient who does get the blood clot? Well, if, you know, we have a, a pretty um, robust um, uh, group that are studying this in our institution because my so obviously, I think that this is a spectrum of disease and we're seeing them at different times. And we have a couple of uh, uh, research nurses who follow them and you know, ask them questions. The interesting thing is this. When these patients, when you ask them, they've had neurogenic symptoms in retrospect. They never made sense. I, for example, a patient from just a couple of days ago comes to mind. He is a muscular guy. He exercises, but you know, he kind of reaches a point where he can't do it anymore. Oh, I'm aching. So, so he's like, oh, gee, I must be aching because my muscles hurt because I, I lifted too much weight. He works for NASA, uh, not NASA. He works for uh, SpaceX. So then he is doing some major wrenching on the new SpaceX thing that's going up to the space. And all of a sudden, his right arm just turns blue, swells and clots because he's really pushing it. Now he comes and uh, we, um, you know, we uh, do the first rib resection of, and again, we call this the offending portion. There is, in our experience, we have uh, compared the ones we did the full rib resection to just the offending part, which is the medial part. The, the nerve complications are non-existent with the medial part. No matter who does the surgery, when you take out the whole rib, especially the posterior aspect, you get the sympathetic chain, you get all kinds of neurologic issues that should not be part of this. So our complications come from taking the back, but really the back of the rib has nothing to do with the blood vessels. So anyway, when we take out the offending portion on this guy, the arm gets better, you know, they stretch the vein, all these things. And then he's like, um, you know, uh, since you discussed this with me, my other arm is feeling kind of <laughs> not yeah. weird. Yeah. And the MR shows compression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Dr. Wright, back in 1939, whatever, he was talking about this very thing. 
the right test is really the test of elevating the arms and in the right person, in the other kind of right mm -hmm. person, you would end up with compression of the subclavian vein. And the Adson test, which as you know, is kind of garbage because mm -hmm. pe people- Well, it was the best it. he had in 1927, right? Exactly, got, you know. yeah. But the people confuse the right and the Adson. Mm -hmm. They really do. And these are whole different things. But really, if you look at the history, you'll see that uh, um, at any rate, people have recognized these issues. And what we're recognizing is that um, basically it's the neurogenic patient who happens to be a mechanic, a baseball player. And, and then he ends up with Paget's drug. Or a neurogenic patient who, you know, I remember some patients who like to have their spouse sleep on their shoulder and then they wake up with the arm swollen. Mm -hmm. But then when you go back and you ask them about symptoms, they've had it for a long time. They just didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So have you noticed any clinical signs in your patients? I know that the typical, for our viewers, typical venous TOS means a blood clot. It's like an on and off switch. None of the spectrum you talk about. And then they can get collateral veins on their chest, their arm swells. Have you seen even subtle findings of that, like supraclavicular fossa edema, or a slight difference in the arm diameter? Do you see that in your patients? Yes, I think yes. I mean, I, again, as you said, we we it's very easy to deal with a patient who clots their arm, right? I mean, then that's that's a known thing that everyone can handle that pretty well, um, the, because the diagnosis is made for you. It's right. the stuff that came before that, and. And really, if you pay attention, then regular neurogenic patient who comes and is talking about pain, you will elicit those kinds of symptoms if you ask them. They'll, but they don't realize that that's what it is, but that's what it is. You know, I saw a patient today. He's 76 years old, which is kind of unusual for mm -hmm. our experience. And he has been spending the last 10 years going doctor to doctor, telling him, he's a very athletic guy, he's, he plays golf and everything, telling him, listen, my game is getting worse, you see? And they're doing shoulder injections and all kinds of stuff like that. But really, we spend very little time listening because it doesn't make much sense uh, if you're thinking a specific nerve compression, right? But at any rate, he had, uh, I was amazed, he's the oldest patient that I've seen but he has bilateral POS from, you know, venous compression at the an inlet. And uh, the, the, so, so I'm hoping, you know, again, um, I don't mean to be sort of dogmatic about this stuff, but you know, it's fascinating as a surgeon, we're, I'm seeing things which just, just don't make sense the way we have talked in the past. Right. You know, it, it's amazing to me that, it cannot be that we're on the wrong path. We, we say we define TOS as compression of the subclavian venonymous junction by an abnormal bone. That's our working definition. And if you really think about it, this, the, the test of that hypothesis is if you resolve that problem, will they be perfect or not? And that's our experience. Uh, you know, the dash, the quick dash scores for these, it's amazing. It's amazing. In my career, I have not seen this. You know, I mean, I really do remember so many times um, either producing new problems for our patients. You know, we do a, a transaxillary and now they got a winging scapula and that now they don't really care about the arm because now their scapula is winged because we did. Right. You see? And, and then what happens is the patients really, um, uh, I think that the, uh, we are not technically capable of removing the costoclavicular uh, joint. If you don't disarticulate that joint, it won't work. Well, you, you might point out to the viewers that your approach is about as far as you can get from the traditional approach. You're coming underneath the first rib rather than over the top. So in me, the surgeon would come down through here, but you're going inside the chest and up from underneath where you have beautiful access. I'm fortunate enough to view some of your surgeries and you have this beautiful access that I don't think anybody could get from a different approach. It really enables you to approach that specific portion 
the offending portion of the rib. Thank you. Actually, you know, it's interesting for our viewers that you obviously know this because you talked about it actually in your discussion. Um, you know, Roos, when he came up with the transaxillary approach, um, he actually set us back, in my view, by mm -hmm. many years. Because before Roos, in 1960, in, in, in the presidential address to the Society of Thor uh, Thoracic Surgery, Dr. Claggett presented fantastic results. But his results were so deforming to the patients because he would um, make an incision, lift the scapula off your chest to go the posterior. to the posterior approach. And to be honest, the, the people who listened said, how can you tell the difference when the patient gets so much pain after surgery, you don't know what, what's what anymore, mm. you see? So Roos's reaction was, well, we're going to do this this easier way. But, you know, we have learned this lesson in other ways, like laparoscopic surgery versus open surgery. Mm. Laparoscopic surgery may be easier for the patient, but the results are not many times for the mm. complicated things as good. So the, the robotic approach has allowed us to do what mm -hmm. Dr. Claggett did in 1960 by taking off your whole chest wall, but right. in a more elegant way. Well, credit Actually, to Roos. You know, the reason I put him in my list is because he's willing to look and see something different, which is just what you're doing, Fareed. Yeah, every doctor could see what you see if they wanted to, but for whatever reason, their eyes are not open. They don't recognize the pattern. This is the value of you trying to make this comprehensive viewpoint to understand this pathophysiology. Yes. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and we, we also know, you probably recall a few years ago where an Italian researcher said that multiple sclerosis is caused by congestion of the veins that come down from the head towards the neck. And there was a lot of controversy about it. But since then, there's a ton of people in my field who study these veins and where they get blocked. It's the same kind of pattern as you're talking about, except instead of coming back from the arms, it's coming down from the head. And, you know, there's plenty of evidence out there that these veins get compressed from a long styloid process, let's say, yes. where the, the, the atlas pressing on it. So what you're saying has some precedent in other areas, but it's relatively new. People don't study the veins very much. It's not as exciting. No, but if you think about it, you know, a vein has a pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. Mm -hmm. Very easy to compress it. Very and versus an artery with 120. You and see? a thin wall, veins have very thin walls. Yes. Very, very compliant. It is, I, the most amazing thing for me is, you know, I, when we do these operations, when we go in, when I look at the collaterals that you mentioned, it's interesting. In the neurogenic patients, there are collaterals inside the chest. Mm -hmm. So the mammary vein will be large. These mm -hmm. other small veins will be large. And when I see that, even in a neurogenic who has nothing going on mm -hmm. supposedly with the vein, I know we got the right diagnosis. And then when we remove the bone, they decompress like a balloon just deflating mm -hmm. in front of your eyes. And when the patient wakes up, they're like, I got a new arm. Huh. And that's amazing, truly amazing. And the other fascinating thing to me is the, the because of blood flow, you know, our operations, when we do little holes in the chest, they're very minimally invasive. However, patients with TOS have a lot of pain. And it's fascinating because we've been looking into this. Why is it that if you do the same robotic operation approach with a lung cancer patient, they have almost no pain? Mm -hmm. The TOS patient has pain. Mm -hmm. And, and we are believed that this is the, the, the blood returning. It is the 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 uh, uh, fact that they actually the chest wall is getting reperfusion, mm -hmm. and the pain is that reperfusion pain similar to your leg when it falls asleep, and now all of a sudden you're massaging it to make it feel better because it hurts. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's great to see this pattern. And we've discussed, for instance, the paper that uh, one of the references you recently listed, where they took dogs and they blocked off the aorta, the main artery and the inferior vena cava, the main vein, the body, and blocking the vein led to earlier changes in the nerves in the lumbar spine, then did blocking off the artery. You would think if you cut off the blood flow from the artery, the nerves would react badly. But in fact, that venous congestion from just slowing down the exiting blood 
really broke down the barrier, the blood nerve barrier, meaning the veins got edematous on a microscopic level very quickly. Yes. And so, uh, you know, one of the re one of the historical paradigms I mentioned was the was Irving Wright when he said there's something going on here. There's one population of patients that get the nerves compressed or stretched. They get pretty fast symptoms. But then there's the other type with congestion. It takes a little longer to develop, but it's a different mechanism. And that's clearly what you're addressing. Absolutely. You know, the artery issue is, is very straightforward. You shut it off, the nerve's dead. So you're not going to feel it. And, and really, the, it, the, the pain and all of that, those symptoms that people feel is the venous uh, uh, congestion. One thing our audience should understand is that the nerve, the way it gets its blood flow is the differential between the pressure of the artery and the vein. Mm -hmm. So if the vein pressure goes up because you're squeezing it and, in, and causing higher pressure, the blood flow from the artery goes down. And that's really the issue. And that, that's why the nerve is screaming because that delta, as it's called, the well, differential is a problem. To, to propose a different way to look at it, if you have an in hose and an out hose and you step on the out hose, that section in the middle is gonna see more pressure and start swelling up. Yes. So, yes. so what you're saying is we do have pathology of the nerves, but a lot of it is secondary to this swelling, this abnormal drain that the veins are backed up. Yes. Yeah, and you know, we see, for example, another example of this, just uh, we notice that there is a condition in, in uh, children, for example, who have congenital heart surgery. Uh, for a long time, we only paid attention to perfusing their brain with the arterial blood flow. But then you would clamp the, the veins and let the pressure elevate in the vein, and you didn't think of too much of it. And those children, unfortunately, had irreversible brain damage, even oh. though they were getting plenty of artery flow. So oh. drain, the venous uh, uh, drainage of the brain is just as important as the arterial there flow because of that. Yeah. Awesome. So interesting things. So if I might ask you a favor, because we haven't been able to get the questions from YouTube, if we get some patients who email us some questions, can we forward them to you and have you answer them first? Patients. Absolutely. But one thing I really want to leave our patients with is anytime there's a question of TOS, you have to do that MR study, which mm -hmm. which is in and Dr. Verdan can talk about it more. But that is the only study that is going to tell every piece of this story in one sitting. That that is truly a game changer. Well, we, we can show the bones just so patients know we can show the bones. We can show the nerves, we can show the arteries, we can show the veins in two different positions. So in specific, that spot that you focus so intensely on where the nerves, sorry, where the veins get most compressed, we can clearly see that in patients along with whatever other nerve compression there is, but it's pretty critical. So great, this is really uh, educational for me too. Really appreciate it. Thank you, it's been a privilege and uh, I appreciate the, the conversation and the invitation. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll join us soon again. Um, to sign out, please just close your browser. I think Herb, our moderator, has left, so he can't sign off automatically. Thank you, and I will talk to you soon, and stay safe. Thank you.